Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, welcome. My name is Gaston de las Reyes and I'm director of the Center for Social Impact and Innovation with Glasgow Caledonian New York College. I'm delighted today to introduce to you Christine Ferrugia and Jeffrey Brown, who will be speaking to us about the future of work and the equitable workplace in a post pandemic world. Dr. Christine Ferrugia is of course a member of our faculty leading courses in research methods. She's also director of research initiatives at the Columbia University School of Professional Studies, where she conducts research on the future of work, lifelong learning and educational access, as well as a research associate with the Gross Border Education Team. Dr. Ferrugia has collaborated and consulted extensively with colleges and universities, higher education associations and national governments on a range of issues in higher education. She holds a PhD from SUNY Albany and a master's degree from Teachers College, Columbia University. Jeffrey Brown is head of technology policy with the Bertelsmann Foundation, leading projects and thought leadership on artificial intelligence and the future of work. He builds networks and platforms such as the futureofwork.org to help policymakers, business leaders, and citizens advance innovative strategy and policy for the digital age. His writing and videos have been featured in a variety of leading outlets, including Axios, Politico, and Forbes. And he has spoken at venues that include the OECD, the Paris Peace Forum, and the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, Jeffrey previously worked with the US State Department and holds a master's degree in political science and European studies from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We're really excited for both of your presentations. Dr. Ferrugia will begin and uh, Jeffrey will continue. To our guests in the audience, you're encouraged to submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll present questions for discussion after both presenters conclude. Thank you so much. Great, uh, thank you, Gaston, and welcome everybody. Just, I will share my screen. Wonderful, well, hello, and thank you uh, for coming today. Um, I'm sharing with you today some reflections on research that I've engaged in over the past couple of years on the future of work and skill development. Um, the, reflex the reflections that I'm sharing today will be available in a book called uh, The Great Skills Gap, Optimizing Talent for the Future of Work. Um, that will be published in June of this year by Stanford University Press. So if the ideas that I'm sharing are of interest, please be on the lookout for that book. Um, I'd like to start off by painting a picture of what I mean by the future of work. Um, it's become a bit of a buzz phrase and the term can mean different things to different people. When I think about the future of work, I focus on how the changes in the world impact people, you know, how they impact workers in particular, and also how we can create processes and systems to help workers navigate these transitions in the work world successfully. Um, our world is changing very rapidly, certainly since the pandemic, um, but many of the changes that impact our lives now we're well afoot prior to 2020. So I'm going to be looking um, at those at those longer term trends as well. So those in the US are likely familiar with this image. I'm not sure if this uh, was a popular show in Scotland, but um, this is a, from a TV show called The Jetsons that first appeared in the 1960s and remained highly popular with children throughout the 1980s. Um, the Jetson family lived in a space-aged future where they were catered to by a robot maid that you see here. Uh, they ordered up their food on a machine that delivered it to them. Um, they engaged in video calls and even had gadgets that were very much like the robot vacuums and smartwatches that are commonplace today. The future painted by the Jetsons was one of technology and automation. These were futuristic ideas at the time but today, technology and automation reaches into every corner of our lives. In the medical field, the use of robotic technologies is now very common. Here you see surgeons from the Mayo Clinic performing surgery using robotic arms. Even in a field that at its core is about the preservation of human life is heavily influenced by automation and technology today. In another industry, the shipping industry, warehouses that were once staffed heavily by people to stock shelves, to take inventory, retrieve items, and so on, have now automated many of those processes. 
Such automation improves efficiency and profitability, but comes at a human cost in the form of lost jobs. Even in our home lives, automation is having an impact. Voice technologies like Alexa alleviate the need to visit a library or even just open up, up a computer to look up information yourself. You can just talk into the air and Alexa will answer your question, tell you the weather, play your preferred music. Other smart technologies even allow you to start your car while you're still inside your house or change your thermostat while you're across town. So these are sort of some uh, fun examples of automation in our, in our lives today. But what is the impact of all this automation on our working lives? What does this have to do with the future of work? I wanna share with you now some statistics that help to tell that story. These figures are pre-pandemic, but they tell a story of a situation that was well underway before 2020 and has only been accelerated by the rapid disruptions that were instigated by the pandemic. A few years ago, McKinsey projected that by 2030, half of all work activities would be automated. This automation was predicted to displace somewhere between 75 million and 375 million, million workers globally, pushing them to take on new lines of work to remain employed. In the US, the predicted displacement was 32% of workers nearly one in three workers having to find new lines of work. Gig work, as it's known, is also an important employment trend. Gig work involves contingent work, such as that engaged in by freelancers and contract employees. Statistics in the US indicate that prior to the pandemic, about 25% of US workers were engaged in gig work as either their sole source of income or as a secondary job on top of their regular full-time job. And one in 10 US workers relied solely on contingent work as their main source of income. While these employment arrangements are often touted for the flexibility they offer workers, allowing them to work when they like and to balance other responsibilities, the darker truth is that these jobs are unreliable. They do not offer security or important benefits like healthcare, paid sick leave, or retirement contributions, especially important uh, in the US because those benefits are largely tied to employment. At the same time, uh, prior to the pandemic, employers report difficulty filling available jobs. According to the Society for Human Resource Management, 75% of employers attribute this to a skill shortage. Another way to think of this, however, is as a skills mismatch. Available workers who need jobs often don't have the skills that are needed for the jobs that are available. They may be trained in skills that are no longer relevant for the job market, or their training and education did not provide them with the right skills for the job market. So the question arises of how to address this problem. Some approach the problem from a public policy perspective, and my, um, my co-presenter Jeffrey will touch on some of that. But as an education researcher, I focus on the role that higher education plays in moving individuals through schooling and into productive and meaningful jobs. So in this final section of my presentation, I wanna offer some food for thought on the key tensions that exist between traditional approaches to higher education and skill development and the innovative and transformational change that the future of work will demand. First is this idea of disruption versus transformation. So the term disruption connotes the sense that changes to industries and jobs will be radical and potentially difficult. In this vision of change, automation pretends massive job losses as workers are forced to make a difficult switch to new lines of work. Transformation, on the other hand, conveys the idea that the coming changes will be gentler and easier to navigate than some observers predict. Jobs may change by incorporating new technologies, but a radical restructuring of the labor market will be largely avoided. So today, you know, one could observe that the pandemic has brought us to the state of disruption. This photo here shows a long line of cars at a food bank 
as a result of widespread, widespread pandemic-induced unemployment. However, there's a question of whether this disruption is permanent or temporary. With time, we may back away from this disruption model and return to a trajectory that's closer to the transformation model. So the implication of these two models for education and training differ. In the disruption model, individuals need to be retrained for new lines of work at a mass scale. These huge numbers, think of the 375 million um, that we, we may be looking at, um, and also in a rapid time frame, so very quickly. While in the transformation models, in, individuals may need to refresh their skills or upskill themselves in order to keep up with the changes in their industry so they can maintain employment. They may not need to do a wholesale shift to another industry, but they do have a lot to learn and to, to um, maintain their employability in their fields. This process is gentler and drawn out over a, lo a longer time frame. Um, the next of these key tensions is credentials versus skills. Today's employers are starting to expand their ideas about how to identify workers who are prepared for their jobs. Some employers are relying less on traditional higher education degrees as the premier indicator that workers possess the skills and knowledge needed for success in the job. As employers rely less on college degrees, the question emerges of how they can identify skills in the absence of a traditional credential. Solutions like apprenticeships, certifications, micro-credentials and digital badges are growing. In emphasizing automation, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the deliberations about the future of work tend to place a great importance on technological innovations and the skills people need in order to um, contend with those technology advances. These discussions typically diminish the enduring importance of human skills. And very closely related to this debate between technical skills and human skills is the dynamic between vocational education and liberal arts education. Now, higher education is historically based on a liberal arts model um, with vocational preparation reserved for lower order educational options. While many employers still perceive a value in liberal arts, particularly prepare for preparing learners to adapt throughout their careers, a sizable segment of employers now claim that a liberal arts approach does not adequately prepare students with immediate skills needed for the workforce. You, know, you can take the example of um, things like coding boot camps that have been growing in popularity among university students and even recent, uh, recent college graduates who are seeking to develop concrete skills so that they can move into good jobs after graduation. And this recurrent theme of change also calls for an examination of what it takes for change to occur and how it can be navigated successfully. Contending with change requires people to adapt, and for some, this is easier than others. Learning new skills and new ways of thinking often requires unlearning old ways and letting go of habits of mind or deeply held knowledge that individuals may have invested much of their lives to master. This raises the question of how to help people unlearn in order to learn anew, especially in a future where lifespans will soon reach 100 years on average. We need to consider how to best support workers as they retrain continually throughout their careers that could, could soon span 60 years. So what is the solution? I'm gonna leave you here with some questions to ponder. And certainly there's no easy answers here. Some questions to consider is, you know, should higher education concern itself with what employers want? Some say that higher education has an ethical obligation to prepare students to be employable and able to craft meaningful careers. Or could employers' demands be too short-sighted and slowly erode the kind of deep thinking and long-term perspective that are strengths of higher education? Skills such as critical thinking, communication, information literacy, and creativity are 21st century skills that are strengths of the liberal arts and are also sought by employers.
I propose that true change at scale requires partnerships among higher education, employers, government, and other relevant partners, rather than sort of individual siloed efforts that fail to reach across organizations and sectors. And I believe that, you know, I'm gonna turn it over now to Jeffrey, who will be sharing um, just some of those kinds of initiatives that he has been working on. So thank you. Yes, Christine, um, thank you very much. And also thank you to Gaston for moderating this and welcome to everyone in Glasgow, New York and around the world. Um, I remember that when I first met Christine, uh, she was actually working on a first uh, draft of the book that she's preparing to publish. So um, with that, um, the presentation that I'm going to give today um, hope that everyone can see my screen, um, is really going to be focused on policymaking and the future of work. So I work at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington, DC. Um, the Bertelsmann Foundation is a small transatlantic think tank um, that's headquartered in Washington, DC, and we're supported by about 300 colleagues working in Germany at the Bertelsmann Stiftung. Um, in Washington, we focus on um, technology policy and the future of work, digital transformation, um, and their interconnects with international relations. So um, with that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on some of the work um, that I've been doing over the past few years with policymakers, not only in the United States, uh, but also in the European Union. Um, and this is actually a background uh, for one of the case studies that we did in my hometown of Riverside, California, that happens to be creating tens of thousands of jobs in warehousing and logistics. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the future of work debate uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so there are there's a cut between <laughs> pre-pandemic um, future of work discussions um, and um, and what's happened due to COVID-19. And so pre-pandemic, um, most people focused on the impact of technology and automation on jobs, tasks, skills, workers, wages, and more. And you realize that here, technology and automation are the forces that are creating disruption. Um, there was no uh, thought ever about how a pandemic would potentially precipitate uh, a lot of disruption when it comes to the future of work. Um, however, uh, pre-pandemic, um, there was, was a lot of uh, there were a lot of studies that were being put out, um, not just by international organizations and consulting firms, but um, by national governments as well uh, on the potential impacts of technology and automation. And so, of course, there was a seminal study that was released back in uh, 2013 by Frey and Osborne the University of Oxford, um, stating that 47% of US employment uh, could be at risk from technology and automation by 2030. Um, however, following the release of that research report, there were other organizations that came out and said that there would actually be net job uh, gain created through technology and automation. So you saw that coming out from Forrester Research. Um, and then just last week, there was the McKinsey report that came out that said that uh, due to the pandemic, tens of millions of more workers would need to be retrained by 2030. So all of this to say that um, uh, this created a lot of uh, unknowns and uncertainty for policymakers, uh, not only in the United States, but, but around the world. If you're a policymaker that's taking a look at all these different estimates that are being thrown out, it creates an incredible amount of confusion. Uh, where should you be creating funding mechanisms? What should your, strat your future of work strategy look like? And so, uh, when the COVID pandemic uh, hit, hit in, uh, in 2020, um, this is an infographic that we released at the foundation, um, basically showing projections for job loss um, due to the pandemic. So um, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, um, going into the pandemic, we actually had historically low unemployment rates uh, in the United States, but then also within certain member states of the European Union. Um, uh, 3.5 to 5.3%. Um, however, COVID-19 um, made all of these numbers spike. Um, and basically this infographic charts uh, what those projections were and then um, preventative measures that states in the European Union and the United States were taking in order to try to tamp down unemployment um, generated uh, by the pandemic. Um, so 
I'm going to talk a little bit about future of work trends post pandemic. Um, <clears throat> pre pandemic, there was this thought that we would have plenty of time to, um, to adjust to the future of work caused by technology and automation. So uh, there was the thought that, uh, that the disruption was going to be incremental, that we would be able to shift workers in certain industries um, to, to, uh, to similar employment in another industry. However, the pandemic showed that that disruption was in fact quite immediate. Um, as the previous infographic showed. So the future of work was a term that was warmly embraced by some, and this tended to be high wage, high skill workers, um, especially workers uh, at uh, technology firms, whether they're in Silicon Valley, New York, or other places. Uh, and then there was this focus on remote work and uh, virtual interactions. So um, there's recent research that's come out that said that 20 to 25% of workers in advanced uh, economies will continue to work from home uh, post pandemic three or five days a week. And that's 5% fi uh, more um, than pre pandemic numbers. Um, second of all, there was this move towards e commerce and digital transactions. Um, so digital transactions have boosted employment uh, in supporting industries. Uh, in delivery, uh, transportation, warehousing. So you've seen a boom in those sectors. And then third of all, um, following these two trends, there's also been the super spread of automation uh, and artificial intelligence. And in a certain sense, this has been um, because companies are eager to guarantee a minimum level of service uh, due to the pandemic, uh, but then they've also realized that, 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 that they need to guarantee a minimum level of service uh, 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 into whatever the next disruption is going to be. Um, and so artificial intelligence is being deployed in uh, warehouses, grocery stores, call centers, manufacturing uh, at greater rates than it was before the pandemic. Um, and basically what this has caused is the lowest paid, least educated workers have been the most vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> And then a big question for policymakers is, given that 25% uh, that, uh, more workers uh, are going to need to be retrained and reskilled than pre-pandemic, um, should and how can we retrain and reskill these workers? So I know that uh, Christine's book is, uh, is focused on that, that policy question. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Future of Work project at the, uh, at the Bertelsmann Foundation, specifically a project that we did in cities around the United States and particularly one city um, that's been hard hit. Um, so uh, the Future of Work in Cities project was intended to bridge the gap between these two numbers. This comes from public polling that was done back in 2018 that found that 77% of Americans think that robots and computers will be able to complete many of the jobs currently done by humans um, uh, by 2030. However, there's this huge gap um, where you see that only 30% of Americans believe that their individual jobs will be impacted by robots and computers during their lifetime. Um, so basically, this is to show that there's a huge gap in what people think will happen to the collective and what people think will happen to them individually. And so this is maybe one of the reasons that we don't see more demand for future of work uh, policy solutions um, from, from policymakers, from leaders uh, around the world. Um, there was a study back in 2016 that looked at the probability of task automation around a number of uh, different geographies, not only in the United States, but in the European Union. Um, and this was using the same um, numbers, the same uh, methodology that Fran Osborne used for their study back in 2013. And there were three areas in the United States uh, where they found that there could be a potentially high rate of uh, task automation. And so those are Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Riverside, California, and Orlando, Florida. And so uh, we decided to focus on these three areas um, as part of our work on the future of work at the foundation. Our project had two main goals. The first was to increase awareness of the future of work as a, po of a, as a policy challenge that policymakers at the city, regional, and state level should be planning for. In the United States, at least, I know it's different in the European Union, um, responsibility for um, workforce and economic development is highly devolved to cities, 
counties and states. Um, so in many cases, the federal government, um, the Department of Labor and the Department of Education are coming up with funding mechanisms and um, those that funding, those grants are being distributed um, to local areas that have created their own workforce and economic development strategies um, in many cases. Second of all, um, this project was intended to aid cities, counties and regions in developing concrete strategies um, to approach the future of work. So I'm going to focus on one case study in particular, Las Vegas. It's been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Uh, this is pre-pandemic. Uh, these are pre-pandemic case studies that we did. And so um, we did large stakeholder engagements uh, across these three cities. Our stakeholder engagement in Las Vegas involved public convenings and private interviews with around uh, 250 stakeholders drawn from um, anchor employers um, in tourism, hospitality, casinos. Um, we spoke with labor unions. We spoke with educational institutions. Um, we spoke with other private sector employers, individual workers, um, really uh, the mayor, <laughs> really the, the entire gamut of policymaking in the Las Vegas area. Um, and these policymakers no, these stakeholders engaged uh, or these stakeholders uh, identified three main challenges. Um, the first was that they have a largely low wage workforce um, in um, Nevada and Las Vegas. And so if you show up with just a high school uh, diploma, oftentimes you could pre-pandemic find a job on the Las Vegas Strip uh, within a day of showing up. Um, there are not very, very strong higher educational institutions um, within the, the city of Las Vegas um, and the surrounding region. Um, and then there's also uh, a structure of low taxes and incentives, um, which uh, create a system in which there is not a lot of funding for retraining and reskilling for workers that need it. However, there are notable strengths that Las Vegas has. It continues to be a notable location that draws not just tourists, but um, businesses that would like to expand. Um, there's a strong sense of community planning um, that's led by their workforce board, um, by the mayor, um, and then by educational institutions at the community college level. Um, and then Las Vegas is making um, notable moves to diversify away from, um, from tourism and hospitality um, to other industries. And so um, at the moment, they're trying to uh, develop autonomous vehicle infrastructure within the city, but then they're also trying to develop um, uh, uh, set up drone development as well. But uh, at the end of the day, Las Vegas remains very much a city of booms and busts. So, um, and you can see that in the unemployment numbers um, that were caused due to uh, COVID-19. So uh, pre-pandemic, um, the unemployment rate in Las Vegas mirrored that of the United States at historic lows. However, um, because Las Vegas is so dependent on tourism, hospitality, um, the, uh, the rate in November of 2020 had risen to 11.5. And you can see that uh, year over year, that was a 7.9% change. Um, however, across the United States as a, uh, as a whole, it was only 3.1%. So Las Vegas goes through these cycles of booms and busts that are pretty, that are pretty brutal um, and cause uh, very, very specific uh, future of work challenges that policymakers should plan for. Um, and this is uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data that was released just last week um, that showed um, that a lot of the growth professions in Las Vegas um, show no sign of returning anytime soon, even if the pandemic were to end um, this week by the year 2029, 20, uh, um, there's going to be a 24.2% uh, decline in restaurant and hostess jobs, 18.6% uh, decline in bartenders. Um, and you can see that it's basically the same story for um, travel and ticket agents, hotel and motel clerks and servers, uh, all jobs that, that predominate uh, within the, the city of Las Vegas. So uh, through our project, we really unearthed three uh, different policy solutions for policymakers. The first was to try to build some strategic planning analysis and research around the future of work um, that was locally oriented. So um, from our perspective, um, there was little uh, value in trying to bring national level estimates um, to Las Vegas. They really need to build up local level capacity um, to predict um, which jobs, which tasks will be most automatable um, going into the future. 
Um, second of all, they need to communicate the impacts of technology and automation to frontline workers that might not necessarily be aware um, that their job could be vulnerable um, either today or in the future. Um, and then um, third of all, they should um, disincentivize the creation of highly automatable jobs. And so this is probably the most controversial recommendation that came out of this project, um, but <laughs> it's something that, that holds uh, true across uh, all three case studies. Um, what, what point is there in um, using public workforce funds um, and resources from community colleges and higher educational institutions uh, to retrain and reskill workers for jobs that could potentially be uh, vulnerable to technology automation and automation uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, so I'm just going to end this presentation by talking a little bit about the role of workforce boards um, in preparing for the future of work. We actually partnered with the National Association of Workforce Boards on this project. Um, they represent roughly 550 workforce boards across the United States. And um, for those that are not familiar with the role of workforce boards, um, they're basically the public workforce system in the United States. Um, and so this public workforce system is supported by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, which was passed by uh, the United States Congress back in 2014. Um, and the United States Congress uh, through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act basically created funding mechanisms um, for the workforce boards to implement job training, um, disperse unemployment benefits, um, and developed a medium term um, future of work strategy in partnership with the Department of Labor. And so uh, workforce boards have been in the media um, during the COVID-19 pandemic because they're the institutions that are not only charged with dispersing um, uh, unemployment benefits, they're also in charge of building up funding, uh, building up workforce training mechanisms, job training mechanisms um, for the post-pandemic recovery. And so these uh, workforce boards also sit on an incredible amount of data through their labor market information systems. Um, and 51% of the, uh, the seats on each board are by law required to be businesses. And so at the end of the day, the public workforce system is training workers for um, the realities of local uh, labor markets across the United States. And so um, just to leave you with some kind of policy challenges um, that not only the workforce boards face, but these local areas do when they when as they're preparing for the future of work is uh, at the local level, who creates future of work strategy and implements future of work policy? Is it employers? Is it workers? Is it unions? Is it educational institutions, nonprofits, or governments? And I think that uh, in each uh, city that we worked in, um, the mix of institutions is different. Um, there's oftentimes a fight going on between um, all of these different stakeholder groups as to who should be in charge of future of work planning um, and who should be implementing future of work policy on the ground. COVID-19 has led to an immediacy and short-term policymaking uh, around the future of work where um, uh, uh, policymakers feel a need to get as many workers back into an uh, employment as possible. And in many cases, they're not paying attention to the potential automatability of um, jobs and tasks of the jobs that are being created post-pandemic. Um, uh, and it's our view that jobs and industries uh, of the future um, require a really, really robust data and data science infrastructure um, to be built um, by um, the workforce boards and um, making that a public workforce system that should be a public good um, rather, than a prop, uh, rather than a private good. Um, and then uh, increasingly in the United States, you see the creation of more long term policy around the future of work, and that's being done through the creation of future of work task forces. So um, the state of California has a future of work task force. Uh, the state of Washington has a future of work task force. And so what they're doing is they're um, convening stakeholders in their states um, and they're creating five, 10, 15, 20 year plans around the future of work. And they're starting to enact legislation around the future of work. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail uh, about this article, but I know that uh, uh, this, this, this presentation was also supposed to be about the equitable workplace. Um, and I would uh, suggest that everyone read this article that we wrote, um, This is Your Office in Artificial Intelligence. Uh, that's the title. 
Um, and basically, we took a look at how new technology, specifically artificial intelligence, is being used by companies around the United States um, to boost employee productivity. Um, so it's not just employee productivity as you're sitting at your desk, but artificial intelligence is actually being designed, uh, is being employed in a way uh, to, uh, to design uh, physical office spaces as well uh, in order to, to, to increase uh, employee productivity uh, in offices that seat 100 or 500 employees, um, which of course has immense ethical uh, ramifications uh, as well. Um, so I suggest everyone to read that article. I know that I'm over time, so I'm not going to get, go into detail about it. Um, so if you'd like more information about the future of work, feel free to reach out to me directly at jeffrey.brown at bfna.org, or you can always add me on LinkedIn. I publish quite a few articles there. So with that, I will end. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey and Christine. My, my head is swirling with all of the different perspectives that, that are relevant for the issues that, that you've raised from governments, unions, NGOs, employers, employees, universities. And um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm digesting that. But let me present to you uh, uh, one of the questions that have been uh, written up by one of our, our guests. Um, how rapidly uh, is the question, can these trends lead to changes in education systems? Um, are we talking about years or generations? And, and the comment is that these are not necessarily robust structures, uh, systems, sorry, excuse me, that these are robust structures that don't adapt quickly. Uh, and, and if I could add to, to that question, um, given your, your view about that, what do you see as um, uh, uh, rapid change opportunities? So, um, uh, you, uh, you know, you can each comment on, 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 this, uh, on this question. Thank you. Sure, I, I can share my thoughts and then maybe Jeffrey might have um, his own to share. So, you know, in, in higher education, change happens slowly, typically. And so this is a, one of the big challenges about the future of work. And, um, you know, in universities and colleges, there's, there's a lot of uh, variability. So there are some institutions or some schools within universities that uh, tend to move very quickly. And those, um, and you know, they want to be very responsive to the um, to the you know sort of employment opportunities, or they work more close. They tend to work more closely with employers. So you know, programs certainly in finance and business are very close tied to job markets. Even in health fields, you know, uh, nursing, uh, medical fields, accounting. Uh, you know, these are all fields that tend to be very closely tied to employers just by virtue of the fields that, that um, they're in. Um, there are other fields, however, you know, think about, you know, traditional liberal arts, history, languages, um, where it can be harder to, to move faculty, who are the ones who are ultimately driving curriculum at most institutions, to move faculty to, um, you know, bring that buy-in, you know, to have that buy-in to make their programs, you know, have some sort of relevance on the job market that's identifiable. Um, so, you know, I think these are definitely ongoing conversations. And, you know, my, my view is that, you know, by sort of focusing on, well, the core liberal arts competencies, like the critical thinking and communications and so on, those are the competencies that employers are looking for also. So I think there's an opportunity there to try to make that connection um, a little more um, clearly or firmly uh, for, for faculty and for students so that they're able to sort of translate that, you know, students are able to translate that into the job market. Um, but, you know, there is, there's no easy quick fix. I think that now, I'll end on this thought, um, and I think that now with the pandemic, though, institutions of higher education are sort of forced with, um, as we all are, with reckoning with how the pandemic and how unemployment and sort of this, you know, world catastrophe and financial catastrophe is affecting everybody. And so um, I think many institutions are, are really looking at uh, anew with their obligations to, you know, make sure that their students are um, graduating into a world where they can, um, they can find employment, and that's even more challenging in in today's um, in today's you know employment situation. 
Thank you, Christine. Jeffrey, would you like to uh, add, add to this uh, question? Sure. So, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the question um, kind of unearths this, this tension that we saw in some of the case studies that we did, particularly in, um, in Orlando, Florida. So Orlando, again, like Las Vegas, is a, is a city that's very, very heavily dependent on tourism and hospitality. Um, but it's also growing really, really rapidly with, um, with companies like SpaceX and Siemens that um, really need expertise in advanced manufacturing. Um, and what they're saying to local educational institutions and what they're saying to the workforce board is, we need you to train tens of thousands of people to run CNC machines so that they can work in advanced manufacturing. We have the jobs. We have the jobs at the Space Coast. Um, we have the jobs in the Orlando area. And so they're putting a lot of pressure on educational institutions and then the workforce board to provide those jobs. And so I think that there's this, there's this tension that will only increase post pandemic um, where educational institutions, and in the case of Orlando, it was mostly the, the community colleges that were saying, um, you know, should we be training 10,000 people, 15,000 people, 20,000 people for um, you know, a singular employer. If there's one employer that's asking for all these workers, are we devoting our resources and, you know, giving over a large percentage of our mission um, to meeting that need? Or are we thinking about the future of work in, in a more strategic way? And so, again, I think that goes back to short-term planning versus long-term planning um, and the need for educational institutions, workforce boards, anchor employers to all work together to decide what the right mix is. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I, I'd like to uh, present two questions that uh, extend this, this first question that we've been discussing, and, and these relate to um, the, what is the right kind of training. So uh, first from our colleague in, in New York, David Grad, who thanks you for, for both for your important research. And, and he wonders whether you have identified insights that um, uh, into the different kinds of professional training and development that uh, will be of greater value in preparing people for the future of work. Um, and wondering in particular about the soft um, and, and people skills versus uh, hard skills. Christine, you began to touch on this theme um, with respect to the liberal arts. So that's one question. What are the, what are the types of professional training and development that, that will be most um, valuable? And then um, uh, another guest, uh, Alexandra Glembocki, is concerned about what incentives exist to provide the kind of training um, uh, that is needed for low, people who are lower income currently. Yeah, so uh, thank you both for those questions. Um, you know, I, I would say in just in, with respect to the sort of the, the people skills versus the technical skills, it's, it's a bit of a combination of both, right? Because many employers, when students are graduating, they are looking for those technical skills. You know, can you do the coding and have you learned that? You know, so they are looking at technical skills when they're looking at a resume. However, um, you know, with sort of, you know, the changing world, higher education is not just preparing students for that first job. And you really need to be thinking about what does it take or what do, what do people need to be able to adapt over, you know, a career that, you know, they, students graduating today, you know, can be working for, for 60 years in their career. And technology is changing at a very rapid pace and innovations are happening much more quickly than they did in, in past generations. So those technical skills actually have a very short shelf life, right? And so you need to be able to, um, you, know, you need to be able to have the skills to adapt and to uh, relearn and continually learn new skills throughout your lifetime because you're not just gonna be in that first job or in that first field most people, you know, don't do that anyway, but there's, you know, there's the expectation that you may end up in several different careers and you need to be able to learn how to keep learning and to keep adapting. And so those, those sort of human skills, those skills to learn and be creative and adapt are, are paramount um, to prepare, prepare individuals, students, graduates for that future of work. Um, and then with respect to Alexandra's question, it's a really important question. Uh, you know, in the United States, individuals tend to pay for their own education and training. And so that's, you know, and it's, and certainly college and university comes at a very high cost uh, to individuals. 
um, in past generations, decades ago, there was higher education costs were lower for individuals. There was more um, government support for, for people to enroll. Um, but it is a huge equity issue and a big question, um, you know, when we're facing massive displacement of workers, massive unemployment, and a need for people to continually retrain throughout their lifetimes, it is the professionals, you know, professional class who's more easily able to afford to go through those training programs and pay for them themselves and be able to adapt in those ways. But as a society, I think we need to be able, we need to be asking ourselves, is this the right approach? And should there be more investment by employers and by governments in retraining and providing that financial support and incentive for individuals to, uh, to retrain? Jeffrey, would you like to comment on, on, on those or? or sure. Thanks. Sure. So, this, so just to touch on the second question, uh, what incentives exist to um, retrain and reskill low-skill workers? Um, in the United States, at least, I would say very few. So, I I don't think that you know large um, anchor employers in the United States, especially with the pandemic, um, have an incentive to do that. In the United States, during recessions, what we tend to do, um, as you saw in the infographic that I presented in my presentation, is we tend to clear our labor market. So, we um, we basically lay off um, a large percentage of our workforce um, during a downturn, which you saw happen during COVID nineteen. The situation in Europe is a bit different. Um, where um, the social support system is different that's provided by governments. And then um, depending on which state you're in, in the European Union, there's a, there's a system of co-determination um, between workers, um, employers, and, and labor unions that really kind of softens the blow um, created by, by recessions. And so, um, at least in the United States, I think that post-pandemic, what we need to do um, is, first of all, we need to focus on um, potentially retraining the workers that companies already have um, rather than wholesale just um, laying people off. Um, and I think that community colleges will play a huge role in doing that. And so um, all around the United States, um, you see that there are community colleges that are able to, to, to pivot um, to retraining and reskilling, you know, uh, uh, a workforce. There's um, an advanced manufacturing center that was created by a community college in Orlando, Florida, um, that is able to serve roughly 2,000 students a year at this point. And three years ago, it didn't even exist. Um, and then I also think that workers maybe need to put some pressure on anchor employers as well to say, um, you know, what is the corporate social responsibility for um, retraining and reskilling um, and spending money to develop and retain a workforce that, um, you know, is already working for you. I don't think that we can, um, I don't think that we can depend on kind of this cycle of booms and busts when it comes to unemployment uh, uh, going forward. Thank you both. And, and thank you to uh, our guests who have uh, uh, fired off a number of great questions. And I'm afraid to say that in the 10 minutes we have left, we won't be able to get to every single question. So I'm in the um, unenviable task of uh, trying to curate uh, here. But let me pose to you a fascinating question, which is um, with respect to one type of role, the leader and leadership. Uh, how do you see the changing role of leadership and leaders in uh, the future of work? To change it up, Jeffrey, would you like to begin there, and and uh, and, and Christine can can follow your 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 answer. Yeah. So I guess uh, I, I guess do you mean leaders at uh, you know kind of a policymaking level or leaders in a uh, at a corporate level? And I, I you know I certainly think that uh, you know leadership when it comes to politicians and and policymakers. Um, what we've been trying to do with our project is to raise awareness across the United States and around the world that people should be planning for this. Um, you know, you see these large mega challenges that are mentioned all the time in the press and by policymakers. So climate change is one that I'm that I'm thinking about. Um, you know, it really is incumbent on local leaders to try to understand this vast sprawling conversation around the future of work and filter down to how it applies to their 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 local community. Um, 
I think that what we've seen across our three case studies is that policymakers understand it. Um, they're developing strategies around it. And that's because they realize that if they're not prepared for the future of work, then they're not going to be able to benefit from technology and automation going forward, that they could be left behind. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that good leaders will acknowledge First of all, that the future of work is some, is an issue that they should be planning for. Um, but then, you know, second of all, I think that the really, really hard thing to do is to launch a community level conversation to say, what does the future of work mean to us? Because, you know, Christine touched on this, the future of work is something that needs to be humanized. It can't just be, you know, 40% of workers are gonna lose jobs in a country. It has to be, it, uh, we have to do a better job of, of working with workers to try to, uh, determine what the future of work is for an individual. Um, because once you start communicating these concepts to individuals, they start thinking about it. Um, they can either retrain and reskill on their own or they put policy uh, pressure on policymakers to prepare. Um, so I think leaders have a huge role to play in this conversation. It's only starting right now. And I think that as think tanks, as you know, people working in research, um, we need to come up with um, kind of a, a suite of policy solutions for these leaders. We can't just depend uh, on universal basic income as the end all be all of the future of work conversation. I really think that we need um, uh, a list of solutions um, that can be you know, locally um, implemented and we need to do a great job of communicating those to, to local leaders um, that are leading the future of work charge. And I'll add to that that you know, one thing that leaders really need to do is talk better to each other and more to each other across sectors. Um, you know, in the in the book that that'll be coming out in a few months, that's you know one thing we try to do. There's a lot of contributors to this book, and you know, there's this kind of gap between um, you know employers. Employers have kind of always complained that you know graduates don't have college graduates don't have the skills that they're looking for at work, right? Um, but higher education kind of thinks they're doing a pretty good job at graduating students who, you know, are well-educated and, and have skills, you know, that should make them successful. So there's this gap between, you know, what employers say they want and what higher education thinks it's delivering. And, um, you know, and the, these two sectors don't actually talk to each other well, especially at the leadership level. They don't actually talk to each other very well and, you know, to try to bridge those gaps. And so in our book, you know, we're trying to bring those different, you know, sectors together as well as, you know, foundations and kind of the government sector, which also needs to play a part. Um, so I think, you know, leadership in the, in the future of work really will require that cross-sector um, dialogue and partnership and, true, you know, true partnership to, to move forward on these issues, especially around equity and retraining, because it's it needs to happen at such a, a massive scale that any sort of one entity or one sector can't do it all on their own. So it really needs to be a, a, a collaboration across sectors. Thank you so much, both of you. And, and again, I, I regret that I won't be able to pose every question, a uh, very good question, but let me uh, pair two uh, concerns um, that, that have been raised by different uh, attendees. Um, the future of work, in, in a sense, is happening right now, and, and it's taking a, a brunt on, on people right now. And so the question is, um, what can employers do to address the, the anxiety and the mental health issues that people are facing because they're uh, in the middle of this transition happening? And, and, and relatedly, um, what do you think employers can do to prioritize equity and equitable workplace? So, uh, you know, the mental health issues and, and equity in the workplace. Christina, would you like to pick up with them? Sure. And, you know, one reflection I have is, is yes, the, we're seeing now sort of how these issues, you know, around the future of work are causing us a great deal of difficulty. There's a lot of disruption. But also on the other hand, we're seeing a lot of positives, right? Um, you know, because of these virtual technologies, we are, you know, many people are still able to exist. They're still able to work. Um, so there are some positives that are coming out of this. We're still able to connect with people in a, you know, 
not in an ideal way, but in some, you know, in some way that does have meaning. So, so I think, you know, certainly, you know, we're going through a very difficult period, but there's are, are some strengths and advantages that we're seeing now. Um, you know, in terms of the, the issues around mental health and equity and sort of employers, you know, responsibilities to that, um, they certainly do have a responsibility to that. And, um, you know, one hopeful thing that I see out there is that um, with the situation, um, individuals, workers, and leadership in many, in many companies and organizations are just, they're more open and, and it's kind of become a more acceptable, you know, acceptable thing to address these issues of mental health and, and you know, the, it's kind of reducing the stigma. Um, you know, people are bringing their whole selves to work because you are working from your home and you have your, you know, your families and your children and your, you know, your living room behind you. So, um, and everybody is struggling. So I think, you know, I, I'm hopeful that this kind of uh, sort of this kind of level of acceptance will continue even when the pandemic is um, it starts to fade. Thank you for pointing out the bright side um, uh, amidst this change, Jeffrey. Yeah, just real quick, I think that you know the the best thing that employers can do is probably to provide you know certain certainty um, you know that that people's jobs are safe and that they won't be you know cut immediately. And then I also think that the pandemic um, has been you know a great opportunity um, for you know employers to deliver future of work training to their existing workforce. Um, you know, this is certainly something that's true for the largely, you know, privileged um, high wage or mid wage, uh, high wage, high skill population that's been able to work from home uh, using Zoom and other collaborative tools. I think that the pandemic has been a great opportunity, um, you know, where some 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 employers have fallen short um, in in in, you know, uh, delivering skills that could be valuable post pandemic. Um, but then certainly, I mean, we have, you know, a terrible um, uh, public policy problem um, with uh, workers, uh, low wage workers who uh, have had to go into work every single day, have not had the opportunity um, to work from home. And I think that post pandemic, uh, you know, those workers are also going to suffer from not having access to ongoing uh, retraining, reskilling. And that's something that anchor employers need to get much better at is, is um, you know, that's we, in the United States, we do a great job of delivering um, ongoing continual education to high wage workers, uh, mid wage workers. Um, however, um, the vast majority of low wage workers do not obtain that. And so hopefully post pandemic, um, it's something that that we can work on, um, not only within corporations, but um, workers and policymakers can can put pressure uh, on, on employers to do that as well and invest in that. Th thank you both so much. Before we, we close, and I regret that the hour is upon us and we could keep having this conversation for many more, let me just give voice briefly to the, uh, what you provoked in the audience questions. Um, there's a question about um, educational institutions' capacity to use analytics to predict future needs. Um, there's a question about uh, to what extent government jobs have a role to play and a positive or negative role to play. Uh, there's a concern about the incentive structure facing private equity uh, with respect to provoking further job insecurity. Uh, a concern about the role of um, liberal arts colleges and also wondering your views about a $15 minimum wage. Um, and then finally about the incentives that corporations may or may not have to actually invest in this retraining. So clearly you, you really uh, animated our audience. Um, these issues are profound, go to the roots of political philosophy and, and the reality of living day to day. So I, I just wanna thank you on behalf of the center for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gaston. Okay, much appreciated. Well, uh, thank you to all our guests for, for joining and giving your thought to our speakers. Bye-bye.